And we have another game with the black pieces, which is good. We're playing three love is in the air three. Knight f3. Okay, nice. So that is not a move we have faced yet. Again, my official recommendation against d4 is the Grunfeld. And I put some thought into that decision. So you should think of the move knight f3 in the same it's it's in the same category as d4 because it transposes so often. So whatever opening you play against 1d4, a lot of people struggle with this concept. With some exceptions, you should play the same thing against knight f3 as you would against d4. So if you're a Grunfeld player, you play knight f6 g6. If you're a Queen's Gamma decline player, you play knight f3 d5. If you're a Slav player, you play knight f3 d5 and then c6. Okay, so whatever opening you play, you essentially play the same setup against knight f3 because it is so likely to transpose into the d4 opening. Of course, knight f3 could also be an independent opening if white plays the king's Indian attack. But in this case, we have indeed transposed to 1 d4, and indeed we respond with g6, which is the gateway to the Grunfeld and the king's Indian. And after the game, I'll talk a little bit about why I'm recommending the Grunfeld specifically and not the King's Indian. G3. Our opponent responds with what's called the Fianchetto setup, surprisingly enough. And to start, we complete the development of our king side. We go castle short. And of course, here we reach the main crossroads. If you've watched my Blitz games, in this position, I mostly play the move D6, which is what you play if you're a King's Indian player. But if you're a Grunfeld player, and for the purposes of this speedrun, we are Grunfeld players, we play the move d5, reaching a totally symmetrical position. Our opponent responds with the main line, c2, c4. And some idiot named Vladimir Kramnik played this against me with white in a classical game. And uh, I think I've even shown that game on stream. This is a very theoretical line, and I'm pretty impressed that our opponent is going for it. Not a common occurrence at, you know, like 15, 1600 level for players to go... Uh, for the Fianchetto Grunfeld. But still, this allows us to fill uh, a, a gap in the speedrun thus far. What do we do in this position? Another major crossroads. There are two main moves. The most popular move at a top Grandmaster level is to play it Slav style with C6. But the more exciting line, and the line that I think is more testing at a club player level, is the move that I played against Kramnik. This is not a bad move. It's also very theoretical. But at least it leads to some imbalance in the position. We play d takes c4. I'm way too bored uh, to play c6. I think c6 leads to some incredibly boring positions. Very often, the position remains symmetrical for a long time. And most games at the highest level end in draws after c6. Knight a3. This is the correct move by our opponent. And here we perform a very instructive procedure. If you aren't familiar with the theory of this line... It is hard to come up with the next move independently. Does anybody know what the move that I'm talking about actually is? Now, the logic behind this move is, here's the thing. We are not going to be able to preserve the extra pawn. We can't play b5 because we give that pawn up. Bishop e6 is an attempt to cling to the pawn, but it runs into the very unpleasant response, knight g5. And if you visualize in your head, bishop e6, knight g5, you could try bishop d5 there, but white counter strikes with e4. And then the bishop has to move again, and you've given up the entire center, and you haven't even managed to, to keep your extra pawn. So what you often see is a situation where you're already going to lose the pawn. The pawn is condemned. So we might as well use this pawn to extract as much damage out of white's structure as possible. So goes the logic, right? If we're already losing the pawn... Why don't we give that pawn up on our own terms? Why don't we force white to at least make some weaknesses in their structure? And that's where the move c4, c3 comes from. White has to play bc, and you might say, well, but doesn't that help white solidify his central control? On the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, the pawn on c3 is now a backward pawn. And of course, white is left with an isolated pawn on a2. But we can't fall asleep here. If we fall asleep, we essentially allow white to prepare e4. We need to counter-strike immediately. We need to grab our own share of the center before it's too late. And of course, we do that with a classic Grunfeld move, c5, leading to what's called a tabia, a position from which there are five or six different viable continuations. The old main line is knight e5. Kramnik did play knight e5 against me. And in response to... 
In response to 95, Black is supposed to sacrifice a pawn. I will show you some of the theory after the game. And there are some very, very exciting lines here. This is actually a super interesting line, both positionally and tactically. And you should be able to sense that. Like, there's a lot going on in the center. But if White doesn't play this in principled fashion, then our next move is, of course, very likely to be knight to c6, putting more pressure on d4. Okay? So it's, it's a super complex position. And I'm going to try to illustrate most of Black's main ideas here as we make our moves. Can you go c5 before pushing c3? Yes, absolutely. So a completely viable alternative is the immediate c5. But after knight takes c4, again, the position gets very symmetrical. And if we play c5 and then c takes d4, white recaptures with the knight. And we want to be careful about a situation where we allow the, the fianchettoed bishop to get too active, right? It's actually in our favor for the knight to remain on f3 because it, for the time being, kind of cancels out the activity of the fianchettoed bishop, allowing us to develop our queen side a little bit more easily. Why can't white just take? Well, if white takes, then he ruins permanently his entire queen side. And that also opens up our own fianchettoed bishop. And in response to dc, we have many moves. We can slide our queen over to a5, forking two of white's pawns. But we can also play the move knight f6 to e4, opening up a double attack on the c3 pawn. And double attack in the sense that two pieces are attacking it at once. And we don't mind a queen trade. If white trades queens, give me the d file, be my guest. So one of the keys to understanding the Grunfeld is that you almost never mind sacrificing pawns. You have to be ready as early as move four or five to give away the C pawn or to give away the E pawn, right? Activity is sacred in the Grunfeld. Whatever you do, you have to make sure that your pieces remain active, just like in all hypermodern openings. Otherwise, why are you giving up the center, right? If you give up the center and you play passively, then, you know, you should be playing the queen's gamut declined. Rookie one. Okay, that is a move. It's not the main line, but it is quite popular these days. And I'm pretty impressed that our opponent uh, knows this amount of theory. Now, what is the purpose of rook e1? Well, the purpose is very obvious. White is preparing to play e4. But you should understand that e4 is a double-sided move. On the one hand, it occupies the center with pawns. But on the other hand, it leaves the d4 pawn a little bit more vulnerable and most importantly, it allows our light squared bishop to develop to g4, putting very significant pressure on the knight and therefore on the d4 pawn. So in these positions, it's not all about stopping your opponent from grabbing the center. Sometimes you want to actually encourage it. So an instructive mistake here would be to play bishop f5. That would be a little bit premature because it leaves the b7 pawn without a defender. And white has a couple of nasty responses like queen b3 or like knight f3 to e5. So in this case, we actually want to proceed with our development. We go knight c6. And we encourage white to play. We encourage white to play uh, e4, sorry. h3. Okay. So that's another very good move. Our opponent is preventing us from bringing our bishop out to g4. Now, there's a very well-known trap in this line. Actually, maybe it's not here. No, maybe h3 is inaccurate. I'm trying to remember... Mm, let me think for a second. I'm trying to remember something. So there is a developing move that you should be inclined to play. If we're not playing bishop g4, and we're not for obvious reasons, what is the second best square for the bishop? Well, the second best square is, of course, f5, which prevents the move e4. And later on, the bishop can actually position itself on e4 in order to cancel out White's most active piece, a very classic idea. But after bishop, G5, uh, after bishop f4, there is a well-known trick that you have to be aware of. White has this very weird-looking move, d5, bishop f5, d5. And hopefully you can understand the idea. If knight takes d5, white forks the two minors with e4. Now, that position is still not the end of the story because the c3 pawn hangs. And if we take c3, we're x-raying the rook in the corner. So things get incredibly complicated there and we could potentially get three pawns for the piece so that's the line i was trying to work out but bishop f5 is far from forced we have a bunch of other ways that we could apply pressure on white center and one other tempting option is for us to play queen to a5 
putting pressure on the knight and flat out attacking the c3 pawn. And the other good thing about moving the queen away from d8 is that we're vacating that square for the rook, and putting the rook on d8 here should be good for, for obvious reasons. So I like the look of queen a5. Bishop f5 leads to some very complicated tactical, complicated complications. Let's play this in a somewhat more conservative manner here. Let's go queen a5. I'm not really in the mood to allow bishop f5, d5, and we'll investigate it after the game. Let's go queen a5. We're asking white a rather annoying question, right? How are you planning to defend the c3 pawn? Now, a couple of tactical observations, and you can sense how complex the position is. In these types of situations, you really have to do the work of making tactical observations, noticing things that could lead to attacking. And one such thing is an x-ray that may appear insignificant. The queen is x-raying the rook on e1. Now, who cares about that? Well, it's actually kind of important. If white plays the move queen d1 to b3, which is not unlikely, then we already have a tactic to exploit it. As long as the rooks remain unconnected, you should always be looking at deflection tactics. What deflection tactic is available after queen b3? Well, you should see it. It's c takes d4, c takes d4, and knight takes d4, deflecting the knight on f3 and then capturing on e1 with check. And it's important that we capture with check because otherwise the queen potentially could get trapped there. But that gives us a tempo to evacuate the queen. Okay, so any move that leaves the rook on e1 without a second defender uh, is, is a precursor to a deflection tactic along this diagonal. Of course, we should also pay attention to the knight on a3. Bishop d2 would blunder the knight in one move. I think white's best move, perhaps even white's only move, is bishop c1 to b2. Okay, good stuff by our opponent. Let's continue applying pressure on the center. How are we going to put pressure on the center? Well, we already know what technique is available for us to do that. We should probably play the move rook to d8. And something actually tells me that queen a5 might be an inaccuracy. If that's the case, it's a very, very instructive moment because of how tempting the move is. Let me think. Yeah, queen a5 might have been... A mistake because the move bishop b2 actually helps white in the sense that it really solidifies the center makes it harder for us to put pressure on d4 but at this point we're in too deep let's go rook d8 and that's a move we should kind of just play automatically and let's see what our opponent comes up with here yeah i don't think our opponent is stream sniping i think bishop b2 is an easy move to find by process of elimination there literally just were no other viable moves all right, so let's not jump to conclusions. We are not afraid of knight. Well, knight c4 might be a good move here. Knight c4 might be a good move here, but, you know, we'll drop our queen back to a6 or to b5, and I don't really see where that knight is, is going to go. So the position remains super complicated, and it's a battle over the center, right? It's a classic Grunfeld game where both sides are jostling for position in the center, we are trying to cause White's center to collapse, and White is trying to expand his central control and make sure that all the bases are covered, essentially. Yeah, the move E4 is possible here. I'm not necessarily convinced that it's the best move, but it would definitely be the principled move. But if White wants to play this position more conservatively, he can also play E3 and really create a stronghold on d4. So lots of ways that white can handle this position, or white could do neither. And the move queen b3 is a lot more appealing now that the rooks are going to be connected and there are no more deflection tactics along this diagonal. Queen c2 is our opponent's choice. All right, so let's unpack this move again we already do not have the deflection tactics because the rooks are connected so let's forget about that i assume the point of queen c2 is to get out of the rooks x-ray and to prepare the move e4 now the, the the downside of the queen's positioning on c2 is that later on we could try to get our other rook to c8 and continue harassing the queen along the semi-open files so the very tempting move, bishop f5, runs into e4. I assume this is our opponent's main 
tactical idea. Bishop f5, e4. And if we play knight takes e4, unfortunately, white plays rook takes e4. And I don't see any ways that we can apply pressure on that rook. It's going to be a situation where white has two pieces for a rook, and we are going to be worse. What I want to do is position the bishop on a somewhat less vulnerable square so that we could get our rook to c8 ASAP. And another question that we should be addressing here is at which point do we take on d4? Probably we should do that sooner rather than later so that the c file is open and so that rook c8 comes with greater effect. So I think the idea is crystallizing in my mind. Here's what we're going to do. We can start with bishop e6, or we can start with c takes d4. But I don't see a reason for us to keep the tension alive. I think we should just take on d4 and get that task over with. And then after white recaptures, we bring our bishop out to e6, which is not an ideal square, but it's as good a square as any. It's the best that we can do. It's definitely better than going bishop to d7. That's a very awkward move. Another positive of the move bishop e6 is that we are trying to keep the a3 knight at bay and covering some of the queenside squares that white could have otherwise used. Well, bishop e6 looks awkward to some of you because it blocks the e7 pawn, and aesthetically, you often are advised against that. But remember, this is a completely different opening. We're speaking a different language here. And at no point are we seriously contemplating the move e5. That's completely contrary to the spirit of the position. So blocking the e7 pawn is not a problem. Well, if white takes with the knight, of course that's possible. But then white, white leaves himself with two very weak queenside pawns. And after knight takes d4, we would not have been obliged to recapture on d4. Let's go bishop e6. So far, I have to say... If white plays a couple more accurate moves, definitely black is going to be worse. And this just shows you that I'm not a specialist in the Grunfeld. I think I know it well enough to teach it in the speedrun. But, you know, okay, e4. Our opponent continues to, to really impress here. But my idea is, of course, to meet this move with rook a to c8. This was the whole concept here. And, of course, d5 looks like it wins a piece. But in response to d5, we can move our knight away, and we will be attacking the queen. So d5 is a paper tiger. What I underestimated here is the prospect of white just moving the queen up to e2. I will admit that I missed the move queen e2, but our opponent goes in very principled style d5. And now the tactics begin. So let's think about where we want to move this knight. Where do we want to move this knight? Well, we have two viable squares. We can play knight c6 to d4. We, we can play knight to b4. But the downside of knight to b4 is that that knight is going to be stuck after white plays queen b3. Right? And then white will be threatening knight c4. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of that entire defensive construction. So the move that I'm inclined to play here is knight to d4. Or knight to e5. These are two very similar moves. So let's calculate. Knight d4. What does white do? Well, white has to move the queen. Probably he's going to move it to d3. Then we probably have to take on f3. And white responds with queen takes f3. And that's super nasty. Because then we finally have to move our bishop. And white can send the other pawn down with e5. And white's kind of rolling us off the board. So we might have to bite the bullet and play knight b4 here. Let's calculate. Knight b4, queen b3, bishop back to d7. And what I like about that approach is that e5 is no longer possible because the pawn on d5 is going to hang. So given the constraints, I feel like knight b4 might be the only move, and I think we should play it. Good job by some of you. You called it pretty quickly. I was skeptical about this move, but by process of elimination, we have to do it. By process of elimination, we kind of have to do it. It looks like I've already played him once. I wonder how that game went, because right now, things are not looking great. Oh, I played him yesterday. I literally just played him. I, I didn't realize that. I played him in my pre well, not in my previous game, but the game before the last. It just didn't register. Yeah, yeah, we, we played him... Very, very recently. Okay. We got to hang in there. 
Yeah, and that was not an easy game either. So this guy is clearly just a super underrated player. Oh, wait a second. I might have some good news. I think I see a really sexy idea. I think I see a really sexy idea. So what, what I'm noticing is that the bishops are staring at each other, right? This is a relationship between the bishops. The bishop on b2 is a type 2 undefended piece. It's protected by only one other piece, the queen on b3. So a tactic should start crystallizing in your mind that essentially tries to force the queen off of b3. And that's the move knight f6 takes d5, which looks very complicated, but it's a very simple idea. If knight takes d5 ed, then we play bishop takes d5, and the queen just has no squares. The only square is e3, but then we recapture the bishop on b2 with interest. So after knight f takes d5, the problem is why I can play bishop takes g7 first. But in that situation, we don't have to recapture on g7. What we can do is move the knight away from d5, discovering an attack on the queen, and then try to take the bishop on g7. But it's not as simple as that. After knight f takes d5, bishop takes g7, let's say we play the move knight to b6. White can drop the queen back down to b2, creating a connection between the queen and the bishop. But in that position, I think we have the move knight b4 to d3, and the queen has no squares along that diagonal that it can move to, so it has to release the contact with the bishop. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go for it. My intuition is suggesting that this is going to work. Knight f takes d5 might be a game-changing idea. Might be a game-changing idea. And this is a, a, a pretty standard tactic where you've got two pieces that are facing each other and, you know, another piece defends your opponent's piece and you're trying to knock it off of its square. And this is why queens are such a liability on the defensive end because anytime the queen is attacked, it's the second most powerful threat in chess. Of course, the most powerful is a check because by rule you have to respond to it. But an attack on the queen is almost as powerful as a check in that your opponent becomes incredibly hamstrung with, with respect to what, what he can do, right? If you're not moving the queen, then you better be threatening checkmate or taking a bunch of pieces in return. But everybody watching should... Th th this should make sense to everybody. This should not be a mysterious move. This should not be a mysterious move to you. But the key is that after bishop takes bishop we're not taking back on g7 because then white simply takes the knight. We take back and white just drops the queen back and we no longer have the attack on the bishop that was the initial idea. Now, after bishop takes g7, we need to find this intermediate move, knight back to b6, opening up an attack on the queen. And if the queen moves anywhere except b2, then we can recapture the bishop. We are a pawn up. The game is not over, but white's position starts to crumble there. Bishop takes g7, knight b6, queen b2. We have knight b4 to d3. That is a very important move, without which this combination might have failed. Yeah, so after bishop takes bishop, we don't have to go knight b6. We have alternatives. We can even go knight back to f6, which might be the simpler move. Knight d5 to c3 is a very messy idea, but perhaps is even stronger. Knight to c4. Wow, I'm impressed our opponent played this. I was apprehensive about this move a little bit, but I don't think it works. I don't think it works. I think we can respond to this move with rook takes knight. In fact, I think we have to play rook takes knight. And there isn't much thinking to do here because otherwise the connection between the bishop and the queen are, is closed and white will be able to take on d5. Okay, pawn takes d5. And by process of elimination... I don't like the look of queen takes d5 because that walks right into the x-ray. I think our only move, well, knight takes d5 blunders the rook. So it, it appears to me that we have to take with the bishop. And that is quite an appealing option, actually, because now we are the one, the ones setting up a potential discovered attack on the queen. So it's time to take stock. We're up two pawns. We're up two pawns. But on the flip side... Our king is now quite vulnerable because we've gotten rid of our fianchettoed bishop, and that's never a good thing. And obviously, our, our pieces on the queen side are all kind of clustered together and rather flimsy. 
So we, we've got the X-ray. That's our biggest asset. But the downside of our position is that the rook on c4 is also a vulnerability. This bishop is not a reliable defender. And the knight on b4 is kind of neither here nor there. So our immediate priority here, unless our opponent blunders the queen to some sort of discover check or, or blunders a fork, right? So we're looking for these types of ideas. But more generally, we want to consolidate. We want to bring our pieces back very carefully. The ideal would be to bring them back toward the center, like queen back to c7, knight back to c6. And if we can play the move e6, we really should consider that in order to solidify the bishop because the bishop is really the you know, the main cog in the machine. It's supporting everything, and we cannot afford to lose that bishop under bad circumstances. Queen b2 check. Let's not go king f8 and get checkmated in one move on h8. The priority here is not to defend the e7 pawn. It's to keep our king safe. King g8. Wow. Our opponent finding all of the testing moves here. Rook takes e7 now is probably best for white. Wow. Okay. I'm definitely met my match here. Let's think. Yeah, there is a pretty big problem here. And I'm trying to find a work a, a way to work around. Yeah, this is exactly what I was afraid of, this type of scenario where white develops a huge initiative in return for the pawn. Okay, so I'm calculating the move knight to d3. White plays queen f6. We play queen to b6 and try to counterattack the f2 pawn. I'm leaning toward the move knight d3, but I'm really unsure, honestly. It's a super risky move. Oh, I have an interesting idea, though. I think I found something very promising here. So rather than going for this super risky continuation, let's play the consolidating move knight back to c6. We need to get rid of this rook, obviously. This rook is white's strongest piece. Now, originally, I rejected knight c6 because it blunders the pawn on b7, or it seems to. But rook takes b7, walks into another x-ray, right? So after rook takes b7, I think we have the discovered attack knight to d4. And if knight takes d4, we drop the bishop back and take the rook, and the knight on d4 is going to be hanging at the end of the line. Both rooks are going to be attacking it. Otherwise, white would get two pieces for a rook. And if we can get the rook to move back, then we can breathe a little bit easier. We're up a pawn. The game will be far from over. But at the very least, we can continue working on consolidating our position. You can't keep track of all that. Well, let me repeat that line. Rook takes b7. Knight c6 to d4. Knight takes d4. And we just play bishop takes back. Bishop takes b7. And all you need to see is that both rooks are combining to attack the d4 knight. And the knight is only one defender, the queen. Yeah, probably assuming that rook takes b7 doesn't work unless I'm missing some crazy tactical detail in that line, which is entirely possible, given how this game is gone. It's, it's possible that the best that white can do here is to go probably rook e3. The classy move, the grandmaster move, is rook to e3. But that's not an easy move for you know, a, an intermediate player to make because if you're moving the rook back, I think the instinct most players have is to move it all the way back. But rook e3 is a very classy move because you're opening, you're leaving the e1 square for the other rook. And white's main source of counterplay here is the open e-file that he can use to try to deliver a back rank mate. So rook e3 is, is, would be an impressive move. I will have to pick up the food, by the way, in like five minutes. So probably when this game finishes, before we analyze it, I'll need to take like a one minute break. Let's please not accuse our opponent of stream sniping. There's zero grounds to assume that he is. Okay, rookie three. He, our, opponent, our opponents are allowed to find good moves, okay? That was a pretty interesting timing, though, I will confess. All right, rookie three. What do we do now? Well, what we should probably do now... What we should probably do now is try to trade queens. But that's much easier said than done. That's the problem. Right? It's much easier said than done because if we go queen b6, or even if we go queen b4, white's queen has this super annoying square on f6. But I have a very interesting idea. I have a very interesting idea. I think we are going to go queen b6. 
And we are going to politely suggest a queen trade. Now, in the event of a queen trade, we're up a pawn and we're chilling. If the queens get traded, we have a free hand in the end game. Okay, so it should make sense to everybody why it is that I want to trade queens in the first place. I did miss rook b3. I did miss rook b3. So there's that. But probably the best move is queen e5. Yeah, probably the best move here is queen e5. And of course, the queen is untouchable. Okay, queen f6. That was a little test. That was a little test. All right. So our opponent goes for the principled line. My idea here... Okay, let's get serious again because this game is reaching its like climactic stage. What was my idea in this position? Well, what I'm noticing is that the queens are again in an x-ray. And because they're in an x-ray, you have to consider knight moves. Notice that the queen defends the rook. So the move that comes to mind is, of course, knight to d4. And in the interest of time, we got to rush a little bit, so let's play knight d4. So there's no checkmate, because the rook defends e8. The queen defends the rook. And the rook defends the knight. So white cannot play knight takes d4, because he blunders the queen. I think white has to go for the queen trade, and he does. And here we need to be very careful. I think if we take the knight on f3, we lose. Because if you think about it, knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, a takes b6, rook to d1, pins the bishop, and then the other rook goes to d3, we lose the game. So we have to play a takes b6, very important detail. Now white can still play rook d1, but we, we are under no obligation in that case to take on f3 with the knight. We can take on f3 with the bishop, and the knight on d4 is very safely protected by both of our rooks. Now the position is objectively drawn. There's no question that the position is objectively drawn. If white plays this carefully and makes a couple more accurate moves, white should be able to hold the draw even down a pawn in a rook end game. But it's not the easiest thing in the world to do it with the minute. So we will see how our opponent handles the defensive task. But this has been a very impressive game by white. So this has been, this has been awesome. Okay, I'm going to try to be as tricky as possible. I'm going to try to be as tricky as possible. I'm thinking about whether I want to take or take on g2 first. Let's take g2 first. I'm going to try to be as cagey as I possibly can. And now we're going to take back with this rook. Now, black's general strategy to try to win this endgame is to double rooks on the second rank. right? Because our pawn majority is hamstrung. We have doubled pawns, so we can't really create a passed pawn on the queen side. We can try at some point, maybe later in the game, to push the pawn up all the way to b3, but that's very far-fetched because white's rooks are very well placed. So that really leaves us with only one idea, which is to try to squeeze the rooks to the second rank and essentially use the attack on the f2 pawn in order to force white to play rook f1. But man, I'm getting zero winning chances here. I think I've got one more chance. Okay, wait. I have an idea. It just doesn't work. Okay, well, Gorski, see what I mean? There's no choice. I can't defend B7. All right, I have an idea. Here. So here's what we're, go we're going to do. We're going to first and foremost force the rook onto F1. Yeah, now we're going to drop back to D6. And... Try to force rook to a1. But our opponent is, is not falling for anything at all. Let's go rook a2. And now he finally falls for something. Rook f6. Now we have a little bit of an edge. Finally, we get a little break. Finally, we get a little break. This still Our position is still not winning. This is still should be a draw. But that was a serious mistake by our opponent. Serious mistake by our opponent. And why is it a serious mistake by our opponent? Because we now have a double attack. We are attacking F2, and white cannot afford to give that pawn away. If white gives away F2, essentially the king gets mated, or, I mean, we will definitely have great winning chances there. Alternatively, if white plays rook B1 F1, then we drop our rook back and take the pawn. And then if the rook goes back to B1, then we go back to A2. 
So we use the attack on F2 in order to tie down White's Rook. And we are going to emerge with an extra pawn here. And with 40 seconds for White, I think we'll be able to squeeze out a win. Okay, Rook F1, we take the pawn. And F4, great move, actually. Great move by White. Now, we can try to trade Rooks here, but I'm not convinced that the Rook trade is in our favor. Let me think. Let's play the move H5 for now. Let's play the move H5 for now and see where it leads. Why am I playing H5? Well, if you're familiar with the Rook Endgames, you should know that this construction is generally considered to be the best. Now we're going to give a check on A2 and force the king to make a decision. We're now going to go back to A3 and cut the king off along the second rank. And now I think the last step in the chain is for us to involve this Rook and put it on C6. And the idea is that we want to go rook c2, and we basically want to deliver ladder, a, a ladder checkmate. But apart from the ladder mate, we are also hunting for white's pawns. Still probably not winning. This is still probably not winning, but it's getting very, very close. So we want rook c2, but that's not our only threat. Our other threat is actually rook c to c3. And we're starting to pick off the pawns along the third rank. So the moment our opponent played f4... I noticed that the pawn on g3 became a very serious weakness. And I tried to devise ways in which we could go after the pawn. And the best way to go after the pawn is to put two rooks on the third rank. So I think in practice, this is already borderline winning. I don't see a way for white to, to, to not only to hold the pawns, but also to avoid checkmate. 10 seconds. Yeah, our opponent is collapsing. Okay, and yeah, this is a losing move because we give a check on c2. And I think that's, ooh, maybe that's not it. Okay, we obviously take rook b3, a great defensive idea by white. Now we can trade, but that might be a draw. So it, we can trade rooks whenever we want to here, right? There's no rush to trade rooks. So what we should do instead is double rooks on the second rank and see where that leads. I don't know exactly where that leads. But first of all, it's very easy for white to get checkmated here. Like rook g1 is a tempting move in time pressure that gets mated with rook h2. So we could squeeze this position out for a very long time. f5, good move. Okay, so taking on f5 is tempting, but it ruins our pawn structure, so I don't want to do that. And our second approach is to keep as many pawns on the board as possible because that raises the chance that we're going to win one of our opponent's pawns. So the move g5 is automatic f6 okay so this pawn has now become a very serious weakness how do we attack it well we don't necessarily want to attack it with our rooks because we want to make sure that our rooks remain on the second rank in order to be able to deliver checkmate so we need to employ our king our king is standing on g8 and doing nothing it's time for the king to do something let's bring it to g6 let's have jx Yeah, this is starting to collapse for white. Rook f3. Well, we could most certainly go king g6. But then we have to be very careful about white bringing the rook down to b8 and starting to deliver a bunch of lateral checks. So what I'd like to do instead, what I'd like to do instead is to make a prophylactic move and play, because I'm not sure, well, rook trade is already winning for black. That's true. A rook trade is definitely winning for black, but we're not in a rush. We can trade rooks whenever we want to. Okay, it's very important to understand that. So I like the look of rook g to d2 in order to prevent white's b1 rook from moving off of the first rank. On the other hand, that might allow, no, I think we should play rook g d2. Does that move make sense? We're, we're, we're just stopping white from going rook b7 or going rook b8. The downside is that we are yielding control of the g file. So what I had to calculate is the move rook to g3, which I think our opponent is going to play. But then we bring our king up to g6 just in time. And actually, we're going to do that anyway, because our opponent is just biding his time. Okay, again, people are asking why not the rook trade, because we are trying to improve our position to the maximum before trading rooks. Have we improved it to the maximum? I think we have. And now I think it's time to trade rooks and win the pawn on f6. How are we going to trade rooks? Well, we're going to do it in the most clinical possible way. We're going to go rook to f2. There is a tactical way to force the rook trade, 
which is a super important concept in rook end games, and I'll show that after the game. Okay, we trade. And finally, we are getting very close to winning the game. I'm getting nervous about my food, which is like sitting outside. But let's finish this off patiently without losing any pawns. King takes f6 for starters. We are trying to keep our rook on the second rank. And to keep white's king confined, we need to defend our pawn. So let's go h4. And the winning approach here is going to be very straightforward, as you'll see. Probably white's going to go king g1. We're going to keep our rook on the second rank. Okay. Now, one very effective approach here is to understand that at some point you can use your rook to block a check laterally. To block a check laterally. So, for instance, a good move here is to play rook to e2. Why rook to e2? So that when we advance our king up to f5 and white starts giving us the side checks, we can bring our rook down and block the side check. We don't just want to keep dancing with our king forever. We want to be able to block the checks so that eventually we could start advancing our pawns. Now, there are multiple ways to win this position and win this game. Each, what I want you to understand is that each individual move is not as important as your overall strategy. If you demonstrate the right overall strategy, you're going to win. So you shouldn't be asking, like, why did I play king f5 and not king e5? And the overall strategy is obviously to set this pawn in motion and to create a pair of connected passers, which we are going to do. How are we going to do it? Well, let's start by playing f6, right? Okay, our opponent is waiting. And now we bring our rook back to e4. And we do that in order to be able to inch our king up to f4. Now we could go rook e2, but at this point, I think we should just take the plunge and play f5. All right. King f2. Okay, now let's start by playing rook to b4 in order to prepare to push the king off, off to the first rank. Now we are finally ready to play g4 and create a pair of connected passers. Now, this is a theoretical endgame. It is not easy to win this if you do not know the winning approach. Not easy at all. So, embarrassingly, I have not brushed up on the winning approach in a long time, but I will do my best. Let's start by huddling the rook together with the king. Again, the same idea. In order to be able to block any of white's attempts at a lateral check. Now we drop our king back to g5. We are now ready to push the pawn up to h3. The reason is that if the king inches up to g3, we knock it away with rook to e3 check. Okay? And of course, the, the overall broad approach here for black is just to advance our pawns all the way until we win. Okay, now... Now we have a bunch of things we can do, but the most efficient method is to give a check on f3 and then to advance the pawn one more time to g3. Again, I want you to notice the placement of my rook. Why am I keeping it close? So that if white starts the lateral checks, which I think he's going to do, we will be able to block this check eventually with our rook. For example, we could go king g4, rook a4 check, and then rook to f4. You want to avoid a scenario where your king is just running around the board and, has, and does not have the ability to get the check blocked by the rook. Okay? White's going to try for a stalemate, but he's not going to achieve it. This game is basically over. And then we will be ready to play h2 check, being very careful to avoid stalemate, of course. Rook f4, blocking the check laterally. And that's it. We finally are ready to deliver the last couple of moves. Now, you never want to play h2 unless you are ready to follow that move up concretely. But here we are ready to follow it up. And we use the same technique as before. If the king moves up to g2, we force it away with our rook with the move rook f2 check. Then we give a check on the back rank, and finally we promote to a queen with checkmate. Wow, what a game. 68 moves. That was the hardest fought speedrun game I've had thus far, and it brings us to 1600. And... Uh, you know, those watching on YouTube, I did play this guy a couple games ago. That was the Karokan game. That was the incredibly complicated fantasy game. So clearly a very difficult opponent. Big, big kudos to our opponent for, uh, uh, for, for holding on for this long and making it incredibly difficult for me. I think I was worse out of the opening. So definitely a, uh, a lovely game. I'm pretty exhausted, though. I definitely need a little break to eat.
Thanks for hanging out. I'll see you later.